What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay guys, uh, so we are getting back into the story of William Stryker, really to crusade. Now, here's the deal. Uh, we did the first part of the story a month ago, and that's the nature of us doing the X-Men chronology. Remember, this is an X-Men chronology, it's not just one of the comic book lines. After the events of House of M, when, you know, 98% of the mutants lost their powers, and all we had were 198 mutants left, Marvel kicked off Decimation. And Decimation runs through, like, New X-Men and X-Men Volume 2, and Uncanny X-Men, and all these different things. And so, when we're doing it in a chronological order, what this means is we'll cover a story like we did, you know, with children, you know, childhood's end, which will be William Stryker launching an attack against a busload of innocent kids, and that's where it drops off. That's the cliffhanger that it leaves us on. And then it'll be like a month and a half before we get back to that. Now, there's also another way that we can do this. What we can do is we can go through individual stories, like story arcs, you know, I'm sorry, uh, individual comic lines, because Marvel will segue this, this whole thing, this whole decimation, that'll go into endangered species, which is basically a one shot and a whole bunch of backup features. And what we could basically do is we can do all the new X Men comics, and then all the uncanny X Men comics, and then all the X-Men 2 comics, and that'll allow us to kind of like run through the whole story of things without, you know, ending on a cliffhanger that we don't revisit for like, you know, two months. But it also allows us to get into those, you know, those events. The problem is we'll reference stories or we'll, we'll cover stories that'll reference events that we haven't covered yet. But I'll leave it to you guys in terms of what you want to do, because I was going through the comments section for Childhood uh, Childhood Inn, and people were just like, why did you leave us on a cliffhanger? <laughs> And again, that, that's where we pick up with this video, right? I mean, this video dealt with the return of William Stryker. Really, the last video dealt with the return of William Stryker. The idea that William Stryker had basically shown up, and he was this guy who had really gone all the way back to Chris Claremont with God Loves, Man Kills. The whole base concept of William Stryker is that he is a man who believes it's his mission from God to kill mutants. So those of you guys who are watching the TV show Gifted, uh, take the character of Dr. Campbell, erase all the science, replace it with evangelical Christian beliefs, and then that's William Stryker. Now, the whole idea behind this was that William Stryker returned through unknown means. We didn't, well, not really he returned. I mean, he was just kind of cast out and had basically been living as a homeless guy. But the idea here was that he had attained some kind of power through unknown means. For whatever reason and by whatever means, William Stryker was able to know when people were going to die and then in turn stop that from happening. The other half of this is that it was all hinting at a greater plan. Well, God has a plan for all of you. And so the implication here is that William Stryker has powers now. That seemed to be the idea. And that's one of the, the things that made him so dangerous is because if he's able to see the future, that makes him more dangerous than he's ever been because it means now he can start launching campaigns and basically defeat the mutants before they even have an idea of what's going on. Now remember, in the post House of M landscape, a lot of groups are vying for the destruction of uh, of the mutant, you know, what's left of the mutant population. Friends of Humanity, fringe anti-mutant groups, whatever. But William Stryker and the Purifiers are the most dangerous because they are believers. William Stryker believes God wants him to kill mutants, and the Purifiers will follow whatever he tells them to, and they cannot be wavered. Not only that, when William Stryker blew up that bus, the initial response, you know, with this whole thing picking up in this funeral is, oh my God, you know, they lost some humans in that catastrophe. That's a terrible thing. What we end up finding out here is it wasn't just one who died. 42 kids were casualties of this act of William Stryker. And that's why that whole thing kicking off that way is designed to be that way. Craig Kyle, Chris Yoss, they knew what they were doing when they jumped into this whole thing of William Stryker. Historically speaking, with William Stryker believing it's his mission from God, he believes that he is immune to any kind of vengeful punishment. He will do whatever it takes takes. There is no limit to how hardcore he will get in order to achieve his goal. When he comes along and he says, it's time for me to start killing mutants, he'll do, he'll kill anybody. And that's why him blowing up a busload of kids was designed to hit at that. It's extreme. It's heinous. It's a horrible thing to do, but it's designed to hit at the nature. That's what William Stryker does. Not only that, but what we end up finding out is that where 42 of these kids were taken out, 15 are being buried at the Xavier Institute because their parents didn't want them there. Their parents didn't want to have anything to do with them. Now, the other half of this is, remember, there's Jay Guthrie, and Jay Guthrie was basically this kid who had effectively walked away. You know, he would he just kind of abandoned the X-Men for a time, you know, and then basically reappeared without his wings. And because of the fact that he was Icarus, you know, because of the fact that it's designed to point at the idea that Icarus, quote unquote, quote, flew too close to the sun and his wax wings melted. This is really designed to hit at the, at the nature of that because, you know, Jay's healing factor is tied into his wings. And so with his wings having been removed in their entirety, he has no healing factor. In effect, Jay Guthrie's human now. And so what we end up doing is we end up picking up with 
with, you know, William Stryker talking to his purifiers, only for us to find out that the next target and the Omega level threat among all the X-Men, the one that we're really shooting for, is Joshua Foley, a character known as Elixir. Now, this is important for a couple different reasons. One, because Elixir is an Omega level character. I mean, he can basically manipulate the biological structure of matter. But this is one of those things that we talk about when we cover like our Omega Beyond Omega level series. This is one of those things that we talk about where we say, and they were referenced as being Omega level in this comic. This is what we mean. For the most part, when it comes to characters, when it comes to mutants, I mean, a lot of people know this, but we'll run over for the people who don't know. You know, there are basically really Omega, Alpha level, Beta level, you know, Beyond Omega level threats, all those things that exist out there. Now, in truth, the term Omega level predates Grant Morrison's new X-Men run by a couple decades. In fact, I think Chris, uh, Chris Claremont used it way back when, but it was just kind of a thrown out. It was kind of a throw out thing of, hey, they're Omega level, meaning like they're, they're powerful. Grant Morrison grabbed that concept, expanded on it, and created a classification system for mutants in his new X-Men run. And that's why people usually attribute that to Grant Morrison. The result is that Joshua Foley is an Omega level threat, meaning he's one of the most powerful mutants in existence. But the important thing to keep in mind here is that William Stryker going after Joshua Foley is not based strictly on the fact that he's Elixir. It's also because of the fact that he plays a very important role. Presumably Stryker knows this because God told him so. And so what we do here is we pick up with the training of this new group of X-Men. Now, this is very, very important because what you have is basically, again, you know, this amazing sniper, you know, this guy is two and a half miles away, basically keeping an eye on what's going on with regards to the X-Men uh, and really with regards to these Sentinels designed for the purpose of just kind of, you know, disabling them and so on and so forth. And that's what these, what the purifiers are doing. That's why Stryker got them together in such a way. Stryker brought these guys together because they all have a very particular set of skill sets. One guy is a surgeon, another guy is a world-class assassin, and another guy is a computer hacker who almost completely unrivaled. And that's the idea, is to use the technology of that guy, or at least seeming to use the technology of that guy, to take down all these Sentinels. Now, what we also end up finding out here is that William Stryker's using another source. Now, if you guys have read this, please don't, like, please don't spoil this for anybody who hasn't seen it. <laughs> because this is the return of one of the best villains ever in the history of the X-Men comics. But we don't initially know who this is. All we know is just that somebody is there that can tap into all forms of machinery and manipulate them. And so using this being who's basically been hacked into by this purifier that William Stryker recruited, they in turn power down all the Sentinels. Now remember, these Sentinels are human piloted. They're the Office of National Emergency Sentinels. And they were put here because the federal government responded to the massive reduction in the mutant population and said, look, we're gonna station ourselves at the exact your institute, no one gets in, no one gets out. We're going to keep the X-Men protected, but we're also not going to let them leave. That's kind of the, the, the crazy thing about this. But the training of these new mutants is actually a throwback to the old Age of Apocalypse line of stories, because in that altered reality, when Apocalypse had basically conquered North America, uh, you ended up having like this new Generation X line of stories where you ended up having Ileana Rasputin and her brother, or maybe it was Kitty Pride. Maybe, I think it was Kitty Pride and her uh, and her, uh, her boyfriend, husband at the time, Colossus, training this new generation of X-Men, and they were ruthless. I mean, they were hardcore. And it's designed to be that way. I mean, in this instance right here, this training segment is designed to be hardcore. They're facing off against Colossus. Now, Colossus is tough, but if they're struggling against Colossus, what hope do they have against the other threats that are out there? And that's the message that's being conveyed here. Joshua Foley, Elixir, arguably the most powerful person here. X-23, Dust. I mean, you have all these really, really powerful beings, but all of them are struggling against Colossus. And that's the point that Emma Frost makes. This is Colossus, and you're struggling against him. What hope do you have if, like, Apocalypse decides he wants to invade the Xavier Institute, which he will? What happens? What if someone like Magneto decides to invade? If Juggernaut appears? That's what Emma Frost is hitting at. There have been so many villains that the X-Men have had to face off against that they have struggled against. And these kids are struggling against Colossus. And that's the whole thing. What choice do you guys have? What chance do you have here? And that's why this training is so significant is because it's Emma Frost basically coming along and saying, okay, your childhood is now over. Like you are in a position now where you are going to become the new generation of X-Men and either you can make it or you can die. And those are the only options that you have. That's why this is so huge and so important is because what we end up doing is picking up in the aftermath of all this, you know, with regards to Jay himself, what's really hinted at is that for him as Jay Guthrie, that he had at some point along the line set these events in motion or at least, it, you know, it's really kind of believed that he did. And so he ends up actually traveling to go meet Soraya and simply says, look, we've been friends for an exceedingly long time, but I have to go fix this, you know? And when I do, I want you to know that everything's gonna be okay, but you have to come with me somewhere along the line. And he gives her an address to this place, you know, 221 North Main Salem Center. And basically says, look, come along and meet me here sometime. Now, for Joshua Foley himself, because of the fact that during the training session, he had lashed out and he had attacked Colossus when he wasn't looking, basically attacked a teacher when their guard was down. The idea 
idea was that he was effectively removed from the team. Now, this is Emma Frost basically saying, look, one, you need some time to cool down, but two, I want to put you in a position where mentally you have a desire to return to the team. Because right now it's anger, because he's a healer. He's one of the most powerful healers in existence, but in his mind, he should have been able to save the kids who died, and he couldn't. He wasn't able to pull it off, and so he feels like a failure. And because he feels like a failure, he's trying to find a way to vent that anger, and he's actually internalizing it. And so an only, the only way for him to really come to grips with this is to have time to cool down, but for Emma Frost to also talk to him as well. But what he ends up doing is kind of storming off, only for you know one of the characters, Lori, to basically come after him and say, look, you can't just take off like this. You gotta come back, you gotta calm down. Those kids are not your fault. The problem is that in the middle of all this, Lori's a assassinated. She's shot and killed by the sniper who's watching everything unfold. And that's when William Stryker makes his move. When you have Jay Guthrie who shows up, we end up finding out that William Stryker was the one that had his wings removed and that he had gone to William Stryker somewhere along the line. So Lori's out of the picture, Wallflower's gone. For some reason or another that's not initially given to us, Wallflower is going to stand in the way of the motivations of William Stryker and keep his actions from happening. And so with her out of the picture, now it's, let's make our move. We're going to attack the Xavier Institute while their guard is down. It's a very complex plan. Not only that, what we end up finding out here is that this goal that William Stryker is able to achieve and his ability to quote unquote see the future, that all comes by the return of one of the most powerful beings in existence, Nimrod, the ultimate sentinel. Now, man, let me tell you something. <laughs> okay, Nimrod. <laughs> I love Nimrod as a character. Nimrod is the ultimate sentinel from the Days of Future Past. In the future of the Days of Future Past timeline, the sentinels, they were evolving themselves. And what they did is their ultimate creation was, was Nimrod. Now, Nimrod ended up leaving the Days of Future Past timeline and traveling to the main Marvel Universe. When he did, Nimrod cleaned house. The X-Men had no idea <laughs> how to cope with Nimrod. And that's a crazy thing. I mean, he was defeated ultimately, but with Nimrod as the ultimate sentinel, let's say that like you're in a battle with Nimrod and by some miracle, you happen to like break the indestructible outer shell of Nimrod. He'll reconstitute himself in seconds. Not only that, one of the biggest benefits that Nimrod has is the ability to not only know what the mutant powers of various X-Men are going to be because he's from the future, but also he has this ability to analyze what those powers are and figure out the weakness of the person that he's fighting. And so that's the whole idea here, is that when William Stryker was just kind of making his way before uh, the M-Day event happened, when 98% of mutant, uh, mutants lost their power, he was suddenly met by the arrival of a time-displaced Nimrod. And when this Nimrod crashed, basically uh, kind of shut down and collapsed, William Stryker brought him back to the church and started recruiting all these different people to his cause. And what we ended up having was William Stryker using these different hackers and so on and so forth to look through the mind's eye of Nimrod and see the days of future past. But where most people would look at Days of Future Past and see it as just a horrible outcome, William Stryker saw perfection, a place where mutants were all wiped out of existence. None of them existed. They had all been destroyed. But for William Stryker, he's so fanatical and so insane that in his mind, even though humans were being subjected in the same capacity as mutants were, at the end of the day, the main target was mutants. And mutants were the main ones who were being wiped out or being put to use as servants. And so in the mind of William Stryker, that's the perfect future. Not only that, what we end up finding out is the reason why William Stryker was able to go to each one of these individuals individual people and basically rescue them from like a car crash or from like a, you know, an, a plane explosion or something along those lines is because he had used the knowledge of the future from uh, from Nimrod to look and see which one of these uh, individuals was going to be the most important to his scheme, which ones he could use and then save them before they died, all the while passing it off as God's knowledge. And so this is when Jay is basically given the truth of the situation, that when he appeared to William Stryker and William Stryker said, I will save your friends, I will bring you guys to a path of a great and beautiful life, what he's saying is, I will save you to God and God will send them to hell because they are demonic spawn. That's the whole perception of William Stryker. It's dubious, but at the end of the day, that's the goal he wants to achieve. And so at this point, we switch back over to Soraya, who had basically, again, received that message from Jay where, you know, he basically said, look, come and hang out with me. Laura Kinney's response is, don't go because it's a trap. And when the question is asked, well, how do you know that? Laura's response is, well, that's what I would do. If I were trying to find a way to take you out, I would lead you to a place where you're going to be defenseless or your powers can be neutralized. And then I would kill you. And so that's the whole thing because the are trying to figure out what in the world's going on and how all this kicks in. Not only that, we actually end up having William Stryker show Jay Guthrie the future that William Stryker's shooting for. The future where William Stryker launches his attack against all the X-Men and the Xavier Institute. The future where all these characters, where all these different people that Sam Guthrie knows, where they're all taken out, they're all eliminated, and they're all killed. That's the future that William Stryker is, is loving, and that's the future that Jay didn't realize William Stryker was looking for. And so because of the fact that Jay has effectively set up all of his friends to die in a massive 
massive onslaught that William Stryker is getting ready to unleash, well, you end up having Soraya show up. Suddenly, Soraya, uh, Soraya is shot to pieces. And the initial thing that we end up seeing is that where they're looking to the future and they're saying, okay, so like these characters should basically disappear from the future landscape. Suddenly, Soraya starts to go away. And then we end up having Jay Guthrie, who's shot by William Stryker. It's cold blooded, it's ruthless, but that is William Stryker. That's why I love his character so much. There's so much character development with William Stryker because he's just a guy, but because of his knowledge of the X-Men, because of how many resources he's devoted into bringing down the X-Men and mutant kind, he's so capable. And in fact, he takes one of the arms of Nimrod and invades the Xavier Institute because all the Sentinels have been shut down and none of the X-Men know it's coming. The Office of National Emergency is supposed to be their protection. If you're Emma Frost, sure, you've got, you know, psychic barriers that are out there to notice whenever people are showing up, but they're only there if you have a reason to put them up. But if you never had a reason to believe that anybody was coming, well then suddenly there's no reason to be concerned about that. And so what ends up happening here is that where you end up having some of these guys who show up to take the body of Soraya to basically dispose of it, what we end up learning is that this is not Soraya. This is Laura Kinney. This is X-23. I read this and I was like, hell yeah, girl. Like, get on it, girl. Because like she starts tearing these guys apart. Like, man, she, man, dude, she rips these guys to pieces. They were not prepared. That's exactly what happens. She, she tears these guys apart. Not only that, at the same time, the Nimrod Sentinel goes online and starts killing off all these purifiers. Now, the initial response of Nimrod is there is a mutant here and his name is Jay Guthrie. He must die. But the problem is that the amount of discharge or the amount of energy it would take to obliterate Jay Guthrie would basically zap whatever energy Nimrod currently has. Now, Nimrod is in a position where it has to ask itself this question. Do I use my energy to achieve my primary goal or do I use this energy to achieve the secondary goal of eliminating Jay Guthrie? Well, then when he analyzes him, he realizes Jay Guthrie is basically bleeding to death. He's going to die anyway. And so he takes off to basically go find the, the particular goal or the one particular person that he's tracking down. This is important because what it means is Nimrod is alive and well in the X-Men universe right now. And under normal circumstances, we would basically say all hope is lost here. And so following this, you have the purifiers who break into the Xavier Institute. They are all prepared. They have mental blocks in place designed to basically hold off against various threats that are there. Not only that, when one of them goes after Emma Frost, Emma Frost does have a secondary mutation that allows her to turn into a diamond form. The problem with this, Emma Frost's diamond form does not allow her to use her telepathy at the same time. And so she could turn back into a normal, into her normal form and use her telepathy. But the question that has to be asked is this, can she beat this girl? Can Emma Frost turn back into her human form and then invoke her telepathy to defeat this chick before that chick just stabs her to death? Is that a possibility? Even then, there's no guarantee that Emma Frost's telepathy would work on this girl because she might have mental blocks in place designed to keep that telepathy from happening. And that's exactly what she says. Your telepathy can't affect us. And so of course, because of the fact that this is a vibranium blade that's made to stab through some of the most durable materials in the Marvel Universe, it cuts right through Emma Frost's diamond form, and this girl just starts taking her out. Now, of course, this leads to things like uh, like Hellion jumping in and saving Emma Frost, you know, but that's the crazy thing, is because while all this is happening, you basically have Forge, who's working on this whole scenario with regards to creating like a sentinel of sorts that's designed to capitalize on the Office of National Emergency, their technology, and so on and so forth. There's protocols that are being uploaded to protect mutants and different things like that, but this is cool, because it really kind of hints the idea of like what other mutants are doing while all this is going on. Keep in mind, Deadly Genesis is happening at the same time this story is happening. So that's why you don't see Cyclops here. That's why you don't see Wolverine here is because they're all off doing Deadly Genesis. They're all off, you know, dealing with Vulcan and that whole thing. And so this is kind of cool because in this instance, you've got Forge, who's basically a mutant with the intuitive ability to understand how things work, who's working on a project of his own, you know, something to basically benefit the X-Men. At the same time, you end up having Soraya wake up, you know, being able to use her ability to manipulate sand and just tear these guys to pieces, different things like that. A lot of these folks are stepping in where they can, when they can, but it's really like mass panic. You essentially have a scenario where William Stryker and the Purifiers managed to deactivate the Office of National Emergency uh, Sentinels, deactivate all the security protocols around the Xavier Institute, sneak into the building, and take all these mutants by surprise, and then use all their knowledge of weapons and tactics to start taking them all out. And so what happens? It all comes down to Joshua Foley, a character that has the ability to heal, that does not have a strong understanding of his powers, literally seizes the mind of William Stryker and essentially just manipulates the entire biological structure of William and essentially kills him on the spot. The problem is that we still have Joshua Foley learning how to use his powers, so we don't know what the effect of this is yet, or at least for the sake of this video, we don't know what the effect is yet. We don't really know what it's going to do to his character. He's just kind of stuck in this catatonic state. But with the return of Cyclops and, you know, most of the X-Men after all this has happened and basically saying, okay, look, we'll try to get the pieces back together, kind of move on from the death of a lot of these younger X-Men, what we end up finding out is that with the Nimrod 
Sentinel that the primary objective is to find its maker. And what we end up finding out is the maker of Nimrod is actually Forge himself. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like. And the next story arc for this is called Nimrod. So uh, yeah, let me know what you guys want to do with regards to those storylines, different things like that, you know, how we're going to arrange these comics. And uh, I will catch you all later. Peace.